path. There is sort of a process that we have explained that in your fall or bodies you have certain wounds or traumas. And this has created internal spirits and separate cells, even the primal self, which is still just a separate self among many. And these are in your fall or bodies. And in order to resolve them and be free of them, you have to do a certain almost mechanical aspect of invoking the energy to transform the energy that makes up these cells. But you also have to do the conscious work of going into them, seeing the belief or illusion they are based on, and consciously choosing a higher reality. Now, what we are saying now is that even when you have done this, there can still be a separate self that was created while you were influenced by your birth trauma and your primal self, for example. And that separate self now has a view of how you should be as a person, as a spiritual person who has this birth trauma. And so even if you have resolved the birth trauma itself, you also need to resolve that separate self that holds this image of how you should be. You could also express this another way that there is the process of resolving all of these things. We could say that the traumas, the wounds, the separate selves, the internal spirits are like magnets that are pulling on the awareness of the conscious you. It is pulling the awareness into being identified with this. But these are very specific things. But then beyond that can be your overall view of life. And it is quite possible over the long time you have been in embodiment that you have a certain level where you have all these wounds and traumas and separate selves, but you have another level where you have built an overall view of life on earth and how you see yourself in relation to life on earth. It is a separate self, but it is almost helpful to think of it in a broader way that it is your, your overall view of life. And so, Many of you, especially when you've grown up in the Western world, you have this very linear mindset of feeling that there's always cause and effect. And what that means for you is that when you do something, it is an effect, and you must have a reason that you can explain to other people, especially the people who are affected by what you are doing. But you also must have a reason that you can explain to yourself, including your outer mind, your, even your separate selves. Because if you can't, then sure enough there will be some separate self, maybe several, that will question what you are doing, perhaps even accuse you of doing something wrong. There may also be other people. And of course, the fallen beings are also spreading out this general awareness in the collective consciousness that you should always have a reason, and that reason should be acceptable according to a certain standard. If you are Catholic, there are certain things you are supposed to do, and if you don't do them, if you, or if you do something differently, you must be able to explain it. And then maybe you can still be allowed to do it. But certainly if you do something that isn't acceptable and can't explain it, then you will be condemned. And it's the same in most other environments on earth. Even spiritual and new age organizations, even as we have said, past ascended master organizations, where there was a very, very strong tendency to judge each other. And so, what I'm saying is that there comes a point where you're beginning to go into Buddhahood, where you can benefit from looking at this process looking at your overall view of life. And then you can say, well, there is this concept that when I do something, I should have a reason that I can explain. But why should I do this?
Why do I have to explain myself? I am an independent being with free will. So is everybody else. I respect, I have a near total respect for the free will of other people. Should I not have the same total respect for my own free will and therefore be able to say I have no obligation to explain why I do something. I don't even need to explain this to myself. If I am acting on an impulse from my I am presence, why should I be able to justify and explain this in a way that my linear mind can fit into the belief system it has been indoctrinated with in this lifetime and many previous lifetimes. Can I not look at this mind, look at it as a separate self, but even look at it as a, there is an overall view of life that I have stepped into and then say, I don't want to adhere to this worldview, this belief system anymore. I don't want to play out this epic drama. I don't want to continue this personal story of how I should be in a material universe. I am willing to break the barriers and step beyond this. That is the higher stages of Christhood. That is the stages of Buddhahood, the beginning stages. And those of you who have it in your divine plan to go through this can use this teaching to quickly go through that process. And when you come to the point where you are willing to do something that you cannot explain why and you cannot justify in a way that other people can understand and accept or that your outer mind can understand and accept, then you will experience a new degree of freedom. This may not necessarily mean that you do some radical outer actions, but inside of you, you will feel a new freedom. And this can lead you to a stage where you can consider what it actually means to be the Buddha in embodiment, or to have a degree of Buddhic consciousness while you are in embodiment. And this I will discourse on even though I know that few people are ready to understand it, I feel it is important to get this teaching into the physical octave. It has been said that the Buddha holds space for earth. My position in the ascended hierarchy is the position of Lord of the world, where I sit as the Buddha and I'm holding space. This is difficult to express in words, but what you can say is this. There is a certain built-in mechanism in the matter light and in space itself that certain manifestations would very quickly create a self-reinforcing downward spiral that for a planet, for example, could cause the planet to self-destruct. So basically what we could say here is that if there was nothing mitigating this, then planets on which fallen beings embody would very quickly self-destruct. They would go into a downward spiral and they would simply be blown apart by the energy. What is actually happening in this process is not entirely similar, but it can be illustrated by the process of a black hole, where you know that in a black hole, when you go beyond a certain horizon, the laws of nature break down, time breaks down, and even space breaks down. In other words, if a planet deteriorated to this level, 
space would contract and the planet would implode. And so, what does the Buddha do? He sits there in the ascended realm and he is holding the spiritual balance that prevents the space of Earth, the space in which Earth can exist from collapsing, from contracting into a singularity. So, we could explain this in a different way by saying that even though everything is made out of the matter light, every structure you see on earth is made out of the matter light, no structure could be formed unless there was an empty space in which it could form. So, before a planet can be created by the Elohim, first space must be defined, and then the matter light can fill in structures and create structures in that space. And so, the Buddha holds the space, the Elohim create the earth, and then beings take embodiment, and they now do whatever they do with the earth. So there comes a point where it is decided that earth will be a planet that would allow fallen beings to embody, and now there needs to be a being with a Buddhic consciousness who can hold space for earth so that it does not collapse in upon itself. This wasn't of course me, because I was not ascended at that time, but this is the office I am now holding. There was another Buddha that held space back then, and there have been a number of Buddhas since then. And so, there comes a point where you reach a certain level of Buddhahood, where you can begin to not only understand this concept intellectually, <coughs> but you can begin to experience the reality of it inside yourself. And then you can realize that when you reach a level of Buddhic consciousness while still being in physical embodiment, you can form a figure eight flow with me, with the Buddha that I am. Because you see, as the Buddha, I have vowed to hold space for earth so that the beings who embody on earth can do whatever they want to do with their free will without causing the planet to collapse. And so, you are of course one of those who are in embodiment on earth. And so you can realize something profound. Why is there war on earth? Well, in an overall sense, I'm holding the space that allows the fallen beings to create war. But is it only that the fallen beings who decide whether there's war on earth? No, it isn't. Because there's war on earth because the people in embodiment are allowing space to, for war to exist in their minds, in their four lower bodies and in the collective consciousness. So in other words, I am allowing space in an overall sense, but what will actually manifest in the physical requires that there are people in embodiment who give space in their minds so that this can happen. The fact that I hold space does not mean that there has to be war on earth, and therefore war is only there when those in embodiment allow it. And so what you can actually begin to do when you reach these levels of Buddhic consciousness is that you can begin to recognize that because you are in physical embodiment, because you have re reached this level of non-attachment where you don't have a personal story or an epic drama that you are seeking to unfold, you are in the non-attached state of consciousness. Because you are non-attached, you actually have the option to decide that you will withdraw space from a certain dualistic manifestation. I 
don't suggest you start out with war because it is a big topic but i suggest that you find something at that appeals to you personally and then you contemplate that first you withdraw space in your own four lower bodies from this but then you can start expanding this and gradually come to the point where you withdraw space from the collective consciousness and i will tell you that one person in the buddhic consciousness can withdraw space from a certain manifestation not war because that would require more people in the buddhic consciousness but in other areas that are not quite as has not quite the same powerful momentum you can actually withdraw space it would be possible as an example for one person in, with a sufficient level of buddhahood to withdraw space for pedophilia for example and that would mean that no pedophile would be able to embody on earth after that cut off point there are however some areas where one buddha cannot make the change but by withdrawing space you make it easier for a critical mass of people to make the decision we no longer want this in our society or on our planet and as we move more and more into the golden age there will be a growing global awareness that you have already seen started growing but it will grow even more and there will come a point where there will be this awareness that it is up to us to decide what we allow to manifest on the planet and that is where one buddha, buddha in embodiment can withdraw space from a certain manifestation that then makes it much easier for a critical mass of other people to come to that outer decision we want this planet to be free of slavery human trafficking drug abuse manipulation of the economy all of these manifestations and eventually there can be such a strong momentum that enough people decide we want this planet to be free of war and then it can happen it will happen so you see my beloved these are some teachings for some of you many of you can just ignore them but what i suggest that you do not ignore is this very concept that you can have resolved your primal self and other separate selves but there is still something missing that is the shift in your overall attitude the way you look at yourself if you look at spiritual movements you will see in many cases that there are people who have been in a certain movement follow a certain teaching and even applied it and practiced certain techniques for decades and decades they have a great understanding of the spiritual path and intellectual linear understanding they may even have built a certain outer persona where they know how to walk like a man talk like a man act like a spiritual person and therefore they can appear to be very spiritual and harmonious and balanced and in control but if you look at it with inner sight you see that this is all out of they haven't actually changed their overall view of life and of themselves so really we can say that if we think about the 144 levels of consciousness that there are people who might have been following an ascended master teaching for 30 years but they have only risen from say the 60th level of consciousness to the 68th level of consciousness whereas they actually had the potential to rise much higher in that amount of time why haven't they risen higher well it's because their 
overall view of themselves hasn't shifted. They haven't been willing to go through that revolutionary shift. Now, as I said, there are some people that just haven't made the progress, even though they have done all the outer things. 